My name's Chris O'Neill. I'm one of the judges of the County Court of Victoria. In fact, there are about um, 84 of us, I think, now sitting on the County Court. And I'll tell you a little bit about my journey and about the journey of others to get there in a short time. Some 10 years or so ago, we commenced a schools program. Uh, we found that many students were coming into our courts, sitting in the back of the court, trying to get a bit of a handle on what was going on in a case in front of them, but really it was difficult uh, to understand what the case was about and what the role of all the participants was. So we started this program, which you're now part of, I'm pleased to say, where we try to have a judge speak to all of the students who come into our courts, uh, either actually or virtually, to tell them a bit about um, the law, about being a judge, about the sort of work we do. Uh, and the programs developed from that. And uh, we have thousands and thousands of students coming through our uh, through our courts um, every year. And it's an absolute pleasure to uh, speak to you about the court. I hope there's some potential lawyers amongst you. Um, I know you're all years 11 or 12 students, maybe even years 10, year 10 students studying uh, legal studies. Uh, but uh, I hope uh, from amongst your number, we get some lawyers. We have a PowerPoint presentation, which I'll go through. Um, Towards the end of the session, we will try to take questions as best we are able uh, in this um, Zoom meeting. But let me start by telling you a little bit about what we call the hierarchy of the courts. You may have seen this in the course of your studies, uh, but I'll run through it briefly with you. At the very top of the pile is the High Court of Australia, which comprises seven justices of the High Court. And they are the uh, most superior court in the country. They only hear appeals, they don't hear actual cases, but they hear appeals from other courts. Um, and I don't, some of you may have traveled to Canberra and seen the High Court. If you ever get the chance you want to go there, it's a, an extraordinary building and a wonderful spectacle to sit in the audience and see the highest court in the land dispense justice. And of course, that court is um, uh, played host to some very substantial cases, including more recently in the Pell case and earlier Marbo and other cases. So it's obviously a very important court in the hierarchy uh, of justice in the country. The next court down there's the Supreme Court of Victoria and in other states, there'll be Supreme Courts or equivalent. Um, Supreme Court has two divisions, the Trial Division and the Court of Appeal. Um, the trial division of the Supreme Court hears major cases, both criminal cases and civil cases. Civil means all the stuff that's not criminal. And the Court of Appeal hears appeals from those cases and appeals from our court, the County Court. The Supreme Court, um, they uh, hear murders. They're the only court in our state who can hear murders and treason, you'll be interested to hear, I think there's been one or two treason cases in the last hundred years, so they don't pop up too often. And they also hear more substantial um, uh, drug cases, terrorist cases and things of that sort. In their civil division, they've got what we call an unlimited monetary jurisdiction, meaning they can hear cases up to millions of dollars and very often do. And in addition, they hear a lot of the um, class action cases, which are now becoming part of our legal landscape bushfire cases and various other cases. Then uh, we come to the county court, which is the court that I practice in. You'll see it's um, outlined in purple there. And if you can see my robes, I wear uh, black robes, but with a purple sash. Uh, I can't explain to you why we have that purple sash, actually. Um, if you were wandering around the streets wearing the clothes we were in court, you'd probably be arrested. Uh, we wear some unusual clothing, but um, they're part of the tradition of the court. In the Supreme Court, they wear um, gowns with red designs on them. Uh, in the High Court, interestingly, they wear the plainest gowns, just black gowns without the um, jabber that we wear here. Our court, the County Court, you might say, why do we call it the County Court? It's a funny name. We inherited it from England with where our law originally came from. And in England, they have counties rather than states. So they call uh, the courts which operate in their counties county court. And that's where we got the name from. We probably should change it at some time, call it something different. 
We are the principal trial court in Victoria. We hear most of the big cases in Victoria, and I'll go through some of them with you in a moment. Um, we're a busy court, uh, cases running in our building here in the city, which is nine floors of courts. Um, we do both criminal and civil matters, which I'll tell you the difference in a moment. And as I said, we've got 84 or more judges. The next court in the hierarchy is the magistrates court. Um, you may be aware of the magistrates courts. You may have been to one, not hopefully as a defendant or involved in a case, but um, if you go to the magistrates court, you see a very busy justice system in action. The magistrates court, um, some cases go for uh, half day a day or some go for some days, but sometimes you can sit in the magistrates court and see 50 cases, maybe even 100 cases go through on a single day. Uh, so it is a very busy place and really worth looking, spending some time if you can afford the time, particularly for those amongst you, I'm sure there are many who've who fancy a career in the law. But that of course is not the end of the justice which is dispensed every day in our state. We have a range of other tribunals and courts. We have uh, VCAT, it's a funny sounding name, it's got nothing to do with veterinary issues. VCAT is the Victorian Civil Appeals Tribunal. That's another very busy tribunal that hears a whole range of cases across many areas, building, guardianship, uh, employment areas, small claims, prejudice in employment, and a great array of other matters. The Magistrates Court uh, here, they hear something up to 100,000 cases a year, and I think VCAT are about the same. Um, then, of course, we have the Federal and Family Courts. They are what we call Federal or Commonwealth Courts, and they hear cases involving federal legislation. Family court, as you might imagine, hears many, many cases about um, uh, marriage breakdowns, about property disputes, custody and access disputes, and a whole range of other matters that come out of that. The federal court is a very large and busy court hearing a range of substantial cases uh, arising out of federal legislation uh, in, in many, many areas. So when you think about it, Every day in Victoria, there are hundreds of courts hearing, courts and tribunals hearing hundreds of cases every day. Uh, it's a busy, unrelenting justice system that um, operates in Victoria and indeed in all states and territories in Australia and federally. So that's a brief statement of the court hierarchy system. County court, uh, my favoured court, um, the court I've acted I've uh, worked in now for 14 or 15 years. I'm one of the older judges, not far from retirement. Some say I should have retired by now, but um, we have two principal divisions, the criminal division and the civil division. In fact, most courts have two divisions. The criminal division, as the name would suggest, is uh, the division where people are charged with major crimes in our case. Um, and they come before our courts and the cases really end up in three different areas, trials, pleas and appeals. I'll start with pleas. Pleas are cases where someone is charged with a serious offence and they plead guilty. They say, yes, that was me uh, who did the armed robbery um, uh, or um, I had the necessary intent. Uh, all of you would be aware of mens rea the need uh, for a, um, a person charged with a serious offence to have the necessary intent. They throw themselves at the mercy of the court. They have a lawyer, a barrister or solicitor representing them and they seek the uh, lowest sentence reasonable, reasonably available. Then we have jury trials. Jury trials are amazing. If, again, if you have the time, if you could spend some time in our courts and other courts, if you come in to see a jury trial, it's uh, all colour and movement. It's, it's a wonderful thing to see. Um, 12 jurors, 12 ordinary people from the streets come into our court. They're sworn to carefully listen to the evidence and give a just verdict. And they hear criminal trials and they decide whether an accused person is guilty or not guilty of the crime with which he or she, she is charged. So they are trials. They are trials where a person says, it wasn't me, I wasn't there, I didn't have the necessary intent, I didn't fulfil the criteria 
to be convicted of a, of a certain trial. And then the jury makes the decision. And if they found the, find the person guilty, then the person undergoes a plea hearing and comes back for the plea. If they, are, if they are found not guilty, then they're released on the spot, straight back out into the community. And we have appeals. Appeals come from the magistrate's court. If you go to the magistrate's court and you are charged and convicted of an offence, uh, then you can appeal. You say the magistrate got it wrong or the sentence was too, too um, severe or, or various other things. And then the judge, our judges up here hear the matter again. What sort of offences do we hear here? Well, all the major matters, armed robberies, major violence offences, uh, drug offences, cases involving death, particularly on the roads, and sadly and rather topically in the news at the moment, sexual assault cases of various types and sizes. And again, rather sadly, I can tell you that statistically in our court, the number of sexual offending cases represents about 50% of all the criminal cases we deal with day in, day out here in this court. And then we have what we call our civil division. Civil means um, everything that's not criminal, really. We have two divisions, common law division and commercial division. Common law means um, essentially a lot of injury cases, people who are injured at work on our roads, who suffer some uh, problem as a result of medical um, medical work in our hospitals or by our doctors and a whole host of other areas. We do family violence work within the common law division, supervision orders where prisoners are under supervision when they're released, um, cases involving children and the department of um, DHHS. And we also have a commercial division, which hears commercial cases, fights between companies, fights by banks to recover monies, disputes about building, um, whole range of matters in our commercial division. And we hear various types of cases. We, many of our cases are what we call causes, meaning they're judge alone trials. But some of our trials involve juries, like in the criminal jurisdiction, but in the civil cases, we only have six jurors. And again, they're just ordinary people who are called into our courts and they hear cases, they decide whether someone has been has received injuries as a result of the negligence of someone. And then they go and assess damages, which is remarkable. They go and decide how much money ought to be awarded to someone who suffered a serious injury at another's hands. We have um, applications of various types. We have judicial mediations. Mediation is a very big part of the work we do in our civil court. We have many, many mediations. In fact, as I'll tell you in a few moments, about 70, 80 or more percent of the cases that start in our civil division end up resolving through mediation. So mediation, which is discussion between parties, resolves a very large number of the cases we do. In our common law division, as I said, we do many cases involving injury, um, commercial disputes of various types. We do a lot of work involving trusts and wills when Someone dies leaving their millions to the cat home um, and not to their three children. And just, uh, those disputes are often heard in our court. Uh, we hear a vast array of other cases, land disputes um, of various types and sizes and many other things. So that's a brief rundown of the divisions within our court. We hear about 10 or 10,000 cases a year are commenced in our court. If you divide that, use your arithmetic, divide that, that's many per day. About 40% uh, start as criminal, 40% are criminal cases, and 60% of the cases are common law and commercial cases in our court. So as I said to you at the beginning, it's a pretty busy place. In the old days, people used to think uh, judges would do a bit of work in the morning and then move off to their club for lunch and play a bit of golf in the afternoon. I can tell you that every judge in this case, in this court, works very hard trying to keep up with the great a range of cases, and particularly in these COVID times, backlog of cases that appear in our court on a day in day out basis. I'll give you some uh, statistics. I know statistics bore everyone, but let me run through them pretty quickly with you. Criminal statistics, 75% of the cases that are started in our court end up as pleas where people plead guilty. Um, why is that so? Well, uh, that's a measure of the efficiency of the police and the other authorities. They prepare the cases well. 
people who are charged, 75% of them plead guilty. And there's a, an interesting part of that, and that is this. If you plead guilty to a major criminal offence in our courts, you get a discount for pleading guilty. And the discount varies. It depends on a whole host of features, but it might be 25, might be even 30% reduction in the sentence you would otherwise have for pleading guilty. And there's very good reason for that. That is that if there was no reduction for pleading guilty, people would all run their cases on a contested basis to trial and just chance their arm. So it's important that people plead guilty. And we see that statistic about 75% of cases as a very healthy one. 15% go to trial. Um, of those 15%, about half are acquitted and half are convicted. We again think that's a very healthy statistic. If everyone in front of our case, our courts was convicted or acquitted, then we'd be worried. We'd say that that is not right. That can't be right. Everyone can't get off or everyone can't get convicted. So we say half and half is a, is a, healthy, um, is a healthy statistic. 15%, uh, about 10% of the cases are discontinued and 5% to go away. In our, in our civil jurisdiction, over 75%, in fact, I think it's even higher now, it's over 80% of cases settle before they go to trial. Again, that's a very healthy statistic, and I'll tell you why. People come to our court, uh, um, some people come to our court in the civil jurisdiction, it's the only time in their life they ever come to court. It's a very difficult, anxiety-ridden and nervous experience for most people. Uh, our cases go in the civil jurisdiction for days. And for a person to see really um, a very significant aspect of their life combed over is a very, can be a very difficult thing. So we encourage settlement. It means parties control the outcome of a case rather than a judge like me coming onto the court and giving a decision after days of evidence. Um, so we encourage it. Um, we're proud to boast. I mean, you hear of great delays in courts and delays are bad because Cases delayed means justice not, is not dispensed. So we try to get our cases on as quickly as we can. And I'm proud to say in our court, in the civil jurisdiction, cases get on promptly. Within six or 12 months of coming to our court, we'll get a case on. In fact, we're now so efficient that sometimes solicitors say, hang on, you got it on too quick for us. We can't, we can't be ready and prepared. So the matter goes away. And judgments, every case involving a judge alone in our, in our courts, a judgment has to be written. I can tell you it's right, like writing essays day in, day out. They're pretty tough things to do. But the judgments we write, 60% um, are given within a month and 90% are given within three months. So again, that's a proud statistic we have. We get through the work here at a pace as fast as we can reasonably do it. And people know the outcome of their cases pretty promptly. All right, now, um, let me go to lawyers and tell you a bit about lawyers. I hope there's some lawyers amongst you. Usually when we have students in class, I ask them, I said, put your hand up who's a lawyer. Um, I hope there's plenty of you out there. But of course, at your stage, years 10, 11, 12, it's pretty hard to say what you're going to do in your life. You're concentrating on your studies, probably a bit of social life, uh, sport, recreation, all the other things you're involved in. But a law degree, I want to tell you, is a very valuable thing to have. It opens doors across so many areas when you're out there looking for employment. There are lawyers' jobs in government, uh, in the police department, prisons, uh, public surf service departments and areas. I tell you some years ago, as a younger judge, I visited most of the prisons around Victoria. It's important. I think when you're a judge, you go and have a look at the prisons. And I was stunned to see young, smart, capable people running our prisons. I went to a youth prison in Parkville and the place was run by a young woman who was in her early 30s with a law degree. So if you've got a law degree, it can open up a lot of doors and you get terrific work and experience at a young, at a young age. Um, there's many, many jobs for lawyers in the private sector and large companies. BHP needs lawyers to tell them whether the work they do complies with the laws of the state and the, and the, and the um, country in which we, they operate. Banks, um, building societies, share firms, a whole bunch of people need lawyers on their books. So there's all sorts of areas there. But there are two more traditional areas where lawyers practice. The first is as solicitors, and the second is as barristers. Solicitors 
are lawyers who are who practice in the law and solicitors may operate in very small suburban or country practices sometimes there's only one solicitor there um, they might be uh, in shopping centers near you in country areas in regional centers or solicitors may be a person in a massive law firm with thousands of employees both in Australia and overseas so there's a great array of work uh, in which solicitors can be involved. Um, essentially a solicitor sits and a client comes to them and says I've got a problem. Might be something as simple as being charged with speeding or uh, some other road related offence or I want to make a will or I'm buying a house or I've been charged with a crime or I've had a marriage breakup and a client comes along to a solicitor and says, look, I've, I've got, I'm in this problem, please tell me what, what should I do? And the solicitor gives them advice. And in your career, if you're a um, solicitor, you get a lot of satisfaction by being able to help people. There's wonderful solicitors practicing throughout the suburbs in legal aid, there's very big legal aid um, aspects of uh, in the law, in the criminal law, who um, do a wonderful job under intense pressure representing people in criminal matters. It's wonderful solicitors who practice in Aboriginal legal aid all through our state and through the country, uh, through all the, the Aboriginal communities. And I can tell you a lot, law is not all about making money and uh, being high profile. Um, you can get a wonderful satisfaction by helping people in our society who need help and solicitors play a very big role in that. Barristers, um, I spent my, well, I was a solicitor for 12 years in a small suburban firm and then I was at the bar uh, being a barrister. Going to the bar doesn't mean going and drinking at the local pub, Being a, going to the bar in legal terms means being a barrister. And the barrister, being a barrister is something I loved. I was a barrister for 16 years and it's all about standing up, your, up on your feet in a court and representing people who are charged with a crime or who are in front of a court seeking compensation or for some other reason. They are the specialist advocates in our legal system. They are the ones who stand up, appear in front of court, challenge the state, challenge the prosecuting authorities or prosecute cases, represent, represent people through all um, aspects of life. And I'm proud to be able to say in the system that operates in our courts here in Victoria, generally speaking, people who um, need representation in our court get representation by school barristers um, and so that their case can be properly prosecuted. And if, like many in our society, you've seen too many American court dramas, you think um, barristers are good-looking people who um, work in wonderful, smart-looking legal firms, driving Porsche, and uh, turn a case over with some brilliant question. Well, of course, that's not the way real life is. Law, like anything, is a lot of hard work and preparation. And the lawyers, the barristers who are the best ones, are not the ones who uh, scream and yell at witnesses, who are loud and aggressive in cross-examination. They're the ones who carefully prepare cases and understand the law and um, question people and challenge people in a in a in a excellent way. And if you've got um, if you like debating, if you like standing up on your feet and having your say, if you've got a bit of stubbornness about you, uh, like arguing, then I can tell you, being a barrister might well be. The role that you would pursue in the law. I've got a daughter who's a lawyer. She's about the most difficult and stubborn child I think in the world and she uh, did law and um, she's actually left the law now I might tell you and she's a teacher down uh, at Mortlake but um, boy was she stubborn. Um, so they're the sorts of people who and barristers advocates are storytellers. I'm sure you've all seen um, people in your community, uh, people around a dinner table, people at home, people with friends who are great storytellers. They can bring a story to life with the most wonderful colour and movement. They're the sorts of people who end up being the advocates and uh, there's storytellers amongst you, then advocacy might be your game. Judges, how are we appointed? Uh, well, we're lucky. Being a judge is a, we're all very fortunate to be judges. Uh, we're appointed by the Attorney General in our state, same um, in other states. Uh, the Attorney General is the Chief Legal Officer in our state, of course, there's an Attorney Federal Attorney General who uh, is involved in Commonwealth matters. The Attorney General usually gets advice from the major legal bodies, the uh, Bar, the um, Law Institute, the other bodies in our community and asks around as to who might be a good judge and appoints them. 
Um, they're mostly, but not always, appointed from people who are barristers. We can work to age 70 years of age. We're appointed to age 70, um, which is pretty old. But I've got to tell you, there's plenty of uh, lawyers, plenty of barristers around at 70 years of age who um, are very astute, very capable, very sharp legal minds and who are very good judges. So nothing wrong with going on to 70 and some even go on beyond that to 75. We've all, as, as lawyers, been in the law for a long time. I've been in the law for 45 years. Um, some say I should have got out of it earlier, but uh, it's amazing how how much experience you get over that many years. So the judges who work in our courts, um, like them or not, uh, they're all very experienced people working very hard to um, provide justice to the people in our state. As I said, there's 82 judges, uh, including reserve judges in our courts, 60% male and 40% female. So the young women out there amongst you, you better get your law degrees and become judges because we need to balance the books a bit further. And there was a very good question asked, um, I'll just refer to it briefly, by someone from, I think, Footscray High School. Welcome to all of you from Footscray High School, um, who very astutely pointed out that about, uh, I think it's 50%, maybe more than 50% of the law graduates are now female. Um, and the question was, how does that reflect in people being appointed? Well, almost 50% in recent years uh, of uh, judges appointed have been female. So that's a very healthy trend. I can tell you back, uh, there's a wonderful old judge, Judge Nixon, who was in our court when he was appointed. Um, there were no women at all, you know, um, 30 years ago, 25 years ago, there were no, perhaps a bit longer. There were no women in our court at all. Um, extraordinary as you might uh, say, as that might seem in today's society. Now, at least half the women who are, uh, half the judges appointed are women. So that's a very, healthy trend. All right, um, let me talk to you a little bit about the profile of the criminal offender that comes before us in the courts here. Look, there's all sorts of people, as you might imagine, who are charged with crimes in our court. There are many um, serious drug dealers who um, are very often in it for the money. They just take the risks for the sake of making very large amounts of money in a very short time. There are people um, who are charged with sexual offenders, uh, offences, um, which is very sad. Uh, sad mostly for the victim because people, particularly young women who are the subject of sexual offenders, offences often bear very serious um, consequences of that offending for the rest of their lives. But um, setting aside some various elements of the offenders, it's remarkable how often in our court here we find offenders who have this sort of background, maybe not all of it, but this sort of background. They are very often from a fractured family. That doesn't mean that their parents have separated, that happens of course regularly, but they've been brought up by an aunt or an uncle or a grandpers, a grandfather or mother, and even spent time living on the streets. Many of them have got very little education. I can tell you, we have people here who don't get beyond year eight and year nine who uh, commit offending. Some people who come before us have never had a job. Some, some of their parents have never had a job. Many, many of them suffer mental illness, um, depression, schizophrenia, personality disorders. They're very common things in the people who come before our courts. Far too often, alcohol and drugs have played a very major role, not only in their fen offending, but in their life. We had, I had a case of a person um, who started drinking at year 12, at least uh, at 12 years of age. And at 12 or 13, that person was, uh, was drinking a bottle of vodka a day. Can you imagine what those, that does to your brain in later years? Um, the offenders have often been the subject themselves of physical, mental or sexual abuse. And of course, not all offenders have that background, but many have elements of these matters. And of course, as you might well expect, the people who suffer those crimes really have no moral compass. They, they struggle to know what's right and what's wrong. They haven't got good teachers around them helping them. They haven't got good family members around them providing support and guidance. And they just go completely off the rails. Don't think for a moment that I um, um, excuse serious crimes. I mean, I've seen the impact of crimes on people in our society and uh, it's just tragic. 
there are many, many offenders who simply have got to be put away in jail for a very long time because their crimes are so serious. The risk of the community members is so immense. Um, I, I can tell you I've seen uh, what crime, what the results of crime does to people, and it's uh, in many cases horrific. Sentencing purposes. Um, the law tells us as judges the purposes we must bear in mind when we come to sentence an offender. Punishment. People who commit crimes must be punished. There's no way around that. Uh, punishment that in all the circumstances is fair and just. That's what we bear in mind. Deterrence. Deterrence is an important sentencing factor. People have got to be deterred from doing the crime again. That is the general community. That's what we call general deterrence. Or this particular off offender. That's what we call specific uh, deterrence. People have got to know that if they want to commit a crime, then they do the time. That's, that's the way it works. Rehabilitation is a very important sentencing com consideration. Um, rehabilitation in prisons is important because when someone comes out of prison, we want them as, as best can occur for them to have undergone all sorts of courses and treatments. So they come out understanding the seriousness of their crime and, under and come out rehabilitated and not likely to do, again, do it again. Fortunately, it doesn't always work that way. We have many repeat offenders, but rehabilitation is important, particularly, might I say, for young offenders and first time offenders. Denunciation, part of the court's role is to denounce and condemn very bad criminal behavior. We as a community, all everyone who works in the courts is a, is a member of our state community. We need to say this conduct is wrong and there are consequences for doing it. And amongst the most important uh, sensing consideration is community protection. The people in our community must be protected wherever possible from people who particularly repeat offenders. Um, there are many offenders in come before our courts who, um, have, who are afflicted by a range of problems, one of which is they simply um, do not understand the nature and seriousness of their offending. And um, if they're let back into the community, then they are likely to commit further offending. So that's a matter that we bear in mind. What role does the court play in public and social um, issues in our community? Well, it plays a very important role. Um, you may, some of you may have studied the Mabo case. It's one of the most wonderful cases in our community. Eddie Mabo is a man from one of the islands off Northern Australia um, who brought his case, which ended up in the high court. I think Mar the Mabo case runs for 220 pages. If you want to be put to sleep at night, uh, read the case. It's pretty hard to get through all the legal complex stuff that you read, but I'm sure you get um, a concentrated synopsis, but it's a wonderful, wonderful case. And this man uh, with very good lawyers representing him, I might say, said that, uh, how can the Queensland government come, up, come onto my lands and tell me that the lands that me and my people have lived upon, worked upon, farmed uh, over generations, over hundreds, thousands of years, how can governments come along and say to me, this is not your land, we're gonna deal with it in a way that we think fit. And he said, that's not fair. And he took the case up to the High Court and the High Court said, Eddie Mabo, you're right. The principle of terra nullius no longer applies. Terra nullius, of course, as you know, meaning that there was no ownership of land before settlement in the 1770s here. And um, Eddie Mabo is a wonderful man, a wonderful lawyers representing him. And it's a wonderful part of the justice system that it, the High Court did what they did. Tasmanian Dam's case, uh, again, a very long and difficult case to get through, but shows the importance of the delineation between the powers and the state and the Commonwealth. Um, and that has very deep impact uh, for many, many aspects of the work that we do. Um, our courts have been involved in asbestos legislation over many years. Asbestos, as you would know, is a cancer causing natural substance. Uh, sadly and tragically, many, many people working with it have died in Australia and overseas. It's, um, tiny fibres get into your lungs and don't show their uh, don't show the disease uh, for 30 or so years. And um, there's been a lot of uh, litigation over many years in our courts and various other courts, which have resulted in uh, legisl uh, legislation involving asbestos and uh, asbestos not being used. And the work we do in our courts awarding, co awarding compensation for workplace injuries and people who suffer terrible injuries on our roads has also had an effect on our society. So 
we in the justice system like to think that the work we do does have impacts uh, beyond just the courtrooms that we sit in. Parole, let me tell you about parole, one of the most important aspects of the uh, criminal justice system in our state and one of the most misunderstood, I think. Um, parole is very interesting. When someone commits a crime, a serious crime, they come before me or another judge, I sentence them. I say the crime that you have committed, the injury that you've caused, the damage you've done to our society is very serious and you have to go to jail. And I might, for example, sentence someone to jail for 10 years, uh, which is a long sentence. Um, and then I might say that I might set a, what they call a non-parole period of six years. So that person gets a jail sentence of 10 years and a non-parole sentence of six years. What does all that mean? Well, it means this. If after six years that prisoner has um, been a, of good behaviour, has done all the courses they're meant to do, has not committed further acts while in jail, has not been disruptive, has not gone into fights, not used drugs, then that prisoner goes before a body called the parole board, which is a very important body, and says, look, the judge said set a six year non-parole period. I've done everything right. I've acted in the way I should have let me out on parole now. So I don't have to serve my full 10 years. And the, um, the parole board might say yes, they might say no, it depends on the person's conduct. If they say yes, the parole board is satisfied that that person has been of good behavior and it's in the interests of the community generally that they be let out on parole. You might say to yourself, as many people in the press sometimes do, well, that's all a nonsense. Why don't they just go to jail for 10 years? One sentence, that's enough. Well, there are two aspects of parole which you must, must understand and which are very important. The first is that our jails are very crowded. They hold many people who've committed very serious violent crimes and they're all uh, in close contact and proximity in the jails. And unless there was a really strong incentive for these people to be of good behaviour, then there's every risk that there'd be further trouble in jail. So it's an incentive for the prisoners in jail to be of good behaviour because they know they're going to get out earlier if they do. And the second thing is that after the six years, that doesn't mean they're home free. That means that they remain under the careful supervision of the parole board. Might mean a whole range of things. Might mean they can't come back um, um, come back, um, come out at night or they can't go to certain places or they can't take drugs or alcohol and so on and so forth. So parole is very important. Um, and uh, never think uh, that um, parole is something that we ought to do away with. Um, tragically, there have been people who've committed crimes while they've been out on parole. Um, things have been tightened up, uh, more careful surveillance has been undertaken, but parole is a very par important part of the work that we do. Now, um, normally at this time, we would do a case study which is effectively you be the judge. I want you all to be judges and see what you would do. Um, the thing is that we've got very little time and we've got many, many questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through this case study pretty briefly for you. I'm going to tell you a bit about the sentencing options that you have. And then I'm going to go I'll leave you to it to, to talk with your teachers and amongst your other classmates as to what you do in the circumstances of this study. And then what I'll do is my staff, um, you may have met my associates, um, Sarah Ward, and Melanie Black, uh, they are young lawyers who help me in all sorts of different ways. They'll send you out the answer, or not the answer, there's no answer. They'll send you out what the judge's decision was and you can see whether you agree with it or not. So this is the case study um, that was an actual case in our court here. It involved a young 21 year old female offender. She was charged with a very serious crime called culpable driving, which um, culpable driving causing death, which carries, can't remember whether it was 20 years or 25 years maximum imprisonment. The person who died <clears throat> was a young 22 year old um, young man. He had organized a party up on a farm that he was working on. I think it was someone's birthday. The young woman who was charged with the offense was working on the farm, the whole bunch of young people present. They were having a few drinks, a few beers, a few wines. Um, they'd all become pretty intoxicated. She was the least intoxicated amongst them all. 
She was subsequently tested in hospital with a blood alcohol of between 0.09 and 0.1. And what happened was some point in the night, everyone said, let's jump in the farm ute and let's go for a burn around the paddocks. And uh, she felt a lot of peer pressure. I said, oh, come on, come on, you've got to drive the ute. You're the one who's less affected. So she thought that if she wasn't the one to drive the ute, then someone else who was really severe, severely affected would have driven it. So um, she um, got, in the, got behind the wheel. They went out into the paddocks and they did uh, donuts or burnouts that you'd be well aware of. There were two people in the back of the ute. Um, of course, in one of the burnouts, the utes tipped over large piece of equipment fell upon one of the young men, crushed him and he died tragically. Another one suffered very serious injuries. Um, and, and there was another person who suffered injuries as well. Um, she was goaded into the crime, no doubt, but she took the risk and she was charged with this very serious offence. She was a young woman who, I'll tell you a bit about her background. She was young. She'd had no criminal convictions for anything, nothing at all, no speeding fines, nothing. Um, the things you've got to take into account as a judge when you go to sentence someone is their character, whether they've got a prior history, mental capacity. Well, apart from being affected by alcohol, there was nothing to prevent her understanding what was going on. Remorse, she expressed immediate re remorse. Her family knew the family of the young man who died and the others that were injured. There's not a day in her life she wouldn't wake up in the morning and um, in, in, in uh, terribly upset by the crime that she'd committed. Hardship, uh, well, um, you know, she um, would suffer in that way for every day of her life. But of course, more significantly, probably would be the family of the young man who died. They would um, miss seeing um, that young man grow up and the others would suffering serious injury would carry that for the rest of their life. She pleaded guilty at a very early time. So she would have the advantage of the early plea. Um, and of course, the specific circumstances of the offence are all relevant. So they're the things that uh, we bump into day in, day out in these courts, uh, trying to bring down a decision which is just, which reflects the sentencing principles, which uh, I talked to you about a little bit earlier. What can you do as judges? Well, you can do a range of things. Uh, of course, you can impose a term of imprisonment. You can put this offender in jail for as long a period as you think, up to the maximum sentence. Bear in mind that the actions of this young woman, while affected by alcohol, caused the death of a young man who just couldn't live his life and whose family wouldn't see him grow up, and two other people who were seriously injured. So that's a very serious matter. And of course, it's been a very substantial campaign over many years in our community to make people aware of the tragedies of the combination of um, drinking and driving. Um, Suspended sentence was a, uh, something that used to be available to us as judges, but was, is no longer available. But I'll throw it into the mix for the sake of this exercise. A suspended sentence means you can say to someone, I'm going to, I'm going to send you to four years imprisonment, but I'm going to suspend it in whole or in part, meaning you don't have to go to jail. But if you commit another offence, then that four years immediately comes into play and you've got to marry that with a new offence. So... It's sort of like a sword hanging over your head, or you can suspend half of it. A good behaviour bond, um, kind of a much lighter offence, it means that you're put on a bond for a long period, longer period of time. Uh, I think, again, it no longer has application to uh, um, something as serious as culpable driving, but I'll throw it into the mix for, for the sake of it. And that means that a person for a period that you determine, maybe two years, maybe five years, maybe eight years, must be of good behaviour. And again, it's a sword hanging over someone's head. You be of good behaviour or else. And the basis upon that might be that this person who was driving the car has suffered because of the harm she's caused. And a community corrections order, finally. A community corrections order is not a lightweight affair. It means that the judge can impose a community corrections order. The offender is supervised by a community corrections officer they might have to do a very substantial amount of unpaid community work in the community. There might be all sorts of restrictions on the hours they can go out at night, who they can see, where they can go, what they can drink. Um, and it can be a pretty serious thing. So they're the sensing options that are available to you. Um, I'll leave it to you to um, think about it. 
I'll leave it to you to decide what you would do. And in a few days time, my associates will send out to your teachers or probably post on the websites the easiest or we'll post it on our website, what the judge did, see what you think about it. I can tell you, I mean, there's a very good question I asked about uh, how we are bound as judges to sentencing people. But as much as you might think judges are fuddy duddy old people who sit up in old chairs and get a red nose, um, we are members of the community like everyone else. We have children, I've got three daughters, we um, uh, think of the world pretty much in the way that everyone does. You know, we worry about crime, we worry about the effect on victims. We worry about pe putting young people in jail at an early age where they can make bad contacts and learn bad habits. We worry about the effect on victims of crimes that many of them carry for the rest of their lives. So we worry about a lot of stuff and we worry about doing the right thing, making the right decision, which is never easy in cases like that. So you be the judges, tell us what you think if you like, um, and we'll post the results of the judge, what the judge said on our website. Now, I think I've got about 10 minutes left. I like to try to answer questions from the floor, wherever that's uh, possible. Um, and uh, Jasmine, tell me, um, we've, got an, we've got some wonderful questions that have been sent in by a whole range of the schools. Uh, really good questions. Um, of all sorts and sizes, and I'm happy to tackle them. I'm happy to answer any questions. I can tell you I've been asked whether judges are allowed to have tattoos. Do you have to have grey hair? How much do you earn? All sorts of stuff. Um, Fantastic. I might uh, jump in with a question from Haywood and District Secondary School, which is how are judges assigned cases um, within the county court? Yep, you can't pick and choose. That's the rule. Um, we are assigned cases usually pretty close to when the case is on for trial, sometimes even the night before. We have in our court building um, a vast um, administrative arm, um, one of which part, a part of which is called the registry. They handle all the cases. My associate Sarah Melanie might speak to the judge, uh, might speak to the registry the night before. So the judge has finished his case. He's up for another one. Give us another case, uh, and they assign a case. And generally speaking, it's the cab rank principle. You just take what you're given. You get the case. Uh, you get it done and finished as soon as you reasonably can. Same in crime, same in civil. There's no, sometimes a case has got a lot of complexities to it and a judge might manage it through a period. I do that with some of the cases. Like you might hear little hearings called directions hearings, checking it's ready, checking the witnesses are ready, checking how it's going. And then eventually the case comes on for hearing before you or another judge. But the idea is um, certainly the parties can't pick and choose. They can't say, uh, we'll have uh, Judge O'Neill because we reckon he's a bit light on. Uh, we'll have um, so and so. We just take the cases as they come off the off the production line. Thanks, Judge. Another question we've had from Emmaus College is: What are some of the most rewarding and challenging aspects of your job? Welcome, Emmaus College. Uh, look, um, challenging. Most of the work I now do is in the civil jurisdiction. I hear a case and then I've got to write a judgment. And I can tell you that's pretty hard yards uh, because firstly, you've got to try and get it right. Um, as I said to you earlier, people who come in front of their, our court invest a lot of time and effort, stress, anxiety and worry when they come before a judge. So judges try very hard to write a judgment which people can read. Um, I ban Latin phrases from my court um, I ban long words. I don't want to hear lawyers, you know, um, talking as if they've um, born in England with a Cockney accent and weird uh, long words. I want simple, straight language. And that's the way I try and write judgments. Very famous English, uh, at least American, um, trainer of judges said, you got to write a judgment like you get home at night and your neighbour says, um, hey, Chris, what did you do today? Oh, I had this case where a fella fell off a building and uh, hurt his back and uh, he reckons that the boss didn't look after him properly. That's the way you've got to write a judgment. So one of the hard things is write a, writing a judgment which is clear and concise and can be read by the people who come in front of you. And sometimes the judgment is five or 10 pages. Sometimes it's 80 or 100 pages. And that's the stuff we do. Um, What's the most rewarding thing we do? Well, as I said to you, 
we like to think that in the justice system, we are a pretty important cog in the wheel. We try to dispense justice fairly. Sometimes when I write a judgment, um, I look back and I think that's, you know, I've, I've done what I'm, what I'm meant to do. I've written it in simple language. I've written it in a way the parties understand and I get some satisfaction from that. Now and again, uh, particularly in the criminal ju jurisdiction, I've had a couple of letters from people I've sentenced um, just telling me that they've, after I sentenced them for whatever it was, they got out and, and they've changed their life around. That's fabulous if you ever see that. I might tell you we've got a Curie court here in our court, which is a wonderful place, um, not because people get their legs speared, but Aboriginal and Indigenous offenders um, come before a Curie court. A judge ultimately always makes the decision as to what the sentence is, but as a judge, you sit with two Curie elders, wonderful, experienced, senior members of the Indigenous community, and the presence they bring to bear in the Indigenous court and the advice they give victims is extraordinary. And that's a very satisfying part of the work we do. I, I love sitting in the Curie Court. I haven't done it for a little while yet. But also getting through the cases. Uh, tragically, in COVID, we've had a big build-up of cases and we're trying to, um, trying to get through that. So that's good when we get that done. Fantastic, Judge. I might ask one more question before we jump to an audience question. We might ask the Grange College a question in just a moment. Um, another question we've had from Upwe High School is, is it hard to keep an unbiased opinion? Upway, I think that is. Sorry, Judge. Uh, Upway. Um, is it hard to keep an That's a good question. Look, it's as judges, we like to think we're pretty impartial. We don't favour one or other side. We don't favour them because they've got a flash low. We don't favour them because they're wealthy or important or influential. We don't favour them because, um, you know, they've the other side of the coin. People have had a hard, tough upbringing. We try to be completely impartial. But we're human like everyone. You know, we're all the subject of all the things that have gone, out, gone on in their lives. Um, we're all... Uh, part of the experiences we've been through. Um, I can tell you not all judges have come through private schools and, you know, uh, high powered educations. I was pretty knock around when I was young, did um, played up a bit, got thrown out of law school uh, when I was younger, um, probably spent too much time mucking around, uh, playing footy and doing other stuff. And I wasn't, a, uh, I wasn't a, an impressive academic student at all. So plenty of judges have got different backgrounds. Um, I like to think we aren't biased. We've got to constantly remind ourselves simply to listen to the evidence, assess the evidence that's presented before us and give a fair summary of the evidence and a judgment which is based upon that evidence. That's what we try and do. Thanks very much, Judge. I might pass over to a Chuka College who's raised their hand. Chuka, if you could please unmute yourself and turn your camera on and ask Judge a question. Welcome to Chuka College. Hi. Uh, so we were just wondering what your most confronting slash difficult case that you've presided over. Um, most confronting and difficult case. There's been a few of them. Um, I found the sexual offending cases difficult, I must say. Um, rape cases when you see the effect upon a victim of um, serious sexual assault is uh, very distressing. Um, I've seen um, cases involving transport accidents where people's lives have been just completely ruined, who end up in wheelchairs, uh, needing the care of family and friends for the rest of their lives, the impact on them of just a moment's inattention, a moment's lack of thought, uh, not thinking that a uh, thing they can drive when they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Um, they're pretty confronting and pretty awful. The impact upon victims in these areas is really tragic. Um, I've seen young people, um, as I said, who've just missed the boat with education, family, teachers, and who end up in our courts and get into a life of crime and don't get out. That's pretty awful too. With that, Judge, we've had a question from the Grange College who've asked, how do you, you as a judge, cope with um, tough and traumatic cases? Um, look, we, we think about that, we talk about that a lot, and we have a lot of judicial education on the point, particularly the judges who sit in crime where they see uh, these disastrous cases day in, day out, um, often involving children, 
Uh, it's pretty distressing. We have a, a pretty good support network here, formal and informal. We have counselling here on site. And I might say we have young associates like my associates, young law graduates who work with us and often see terrible uh, parts of the evidence, photographs, graphic photographs and pictures and people giving testimony in some of the cases that we see. Um, so we have on-site counselling. Um, we have a peer support network. We all try and keep an eye on each other like we should um, to provide support. And if there's any indications that a judge really or judge or associates or other people in court are being affected by these things, then we move pretty promptly. Fantastic. Thanks, Judge. I might wrap up with one last question um, from Emmaus. Um, to what extent is precedent considered in the sentencing of an accused at a criminal trial? Precedent is essential and an important consideration in almost everything we do. Precedent are what courts have done before us over many years, and particularly the appeal courts above us. They set guidelines, they set um, a range of um, sentencing options which may apply to a crime. I mean, almost every crime has subjective individual elements. It's pretty hard to say in another crime up the road, the victim got eight years, so that must apply because every victim's different, every perpetrator's different, every case is different. But sentencing guidelines from higher courts are very important. And we must as judges bear them in mind. We must look at what comparable um, sentencing in other courts, superior courts uh, have been. We must uh, apply them. We must, um, you can't go rogue as a judge. A lot of rules and regulations that bind you. You've got to work within the precedent system in our state. Applies in civil cases as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Judge. I think that um, that'll sum up our question time for today. So with that, I'd like to thank you, Judge O'Neill, and thank you to all the students and teachers who attended this event and for all of your great questions.